It's often a good idea when writing expressions to use unnecessary parentheses for clarity, that is, to include parentheses around the sub-expressions which otherwise don't require parentheses. Like here, for example, we have a less than operation and a greater than operation connected by the AND operator. While the AND operator has a lower precedence in either less than or greater than, the intent is clearer visually if we throw parentheses around both operands to the AND operation. Not only does this have the benefit of being visually clearer, it just happens that many programmers often forget which operators have a higher precedence than others. With the extra parentheses here, they just don't have to think about that. When it comes to spacing in expressions, always place spaces on both sides of binary operators, like the plus sign. Also, put a space after each comma in a list of parameters or arguments, and never put a space after a symbolic unary operator, like the exclamation mark for not, nor should you ever put a space after an opening paren or before a closing paren. Like here you see in the call to foo on the top, the parens are padded with spaces. Don't do that. In general, the rule about spaces is where convention says to put a space, just put a single space rather than more than one. I can say quite confidently that the rules I just listed, those are pretty much the standard and most people follow those. Uh, a few people don't, um, but don't be one of those people. Another good practice with expressions is to split complicated expressions across multiple statements. So here, for example, on the bottom in red, you see one large expression, the value of which is being assigned to Kim. We can break this up, however, by first assigning one of its sub-expressions to a variable and then using that variable in its place. So here we're taking the call to Harry, first assigning that to a variable Mike, and then using Mike where we previously had that call to Harry. Probably the most debated point of style in all of programming is where to place the curly braces in languages which use curly braces like JavaScript, C, C++, and Java. The style I strongly favor is the one used most commonly in Java and JavaScript. And in this style, we place the opening curly brace at the end of what you could call the header of the statement, the line where we have the reserved word if, or else, or function, or whatever. As for the closing curly brace, it should line up with the indentation of the opening line. So here it's in the same column as the f in the reserved word function. As for indentation, you always indent the body of each pair of curly braces by one level. That part everyone seems to agree on. What they disagree about is what one level should be. Should it be six spaces, eight spaces, a tab character, or as I prefer, four spaces? In the Linux kernel code, for example, the prescribed style there is to use eight spaces per indent, with the rationale that it makes the indentation visually extremely clear, and also it has the virtue of discouraging too many levels of nesting. When every branch or loop requires eight spaces, that naturally discourages programmers from nesting too deep. I, however, find eight spaces visually excessive. Yes, it's very clear, but it looks a bit ridiculous in my eyes. Definitely you want to do more than two spaces, which some people prescribe, though I think that's pretty crazy. So I think four is actually the nice medium. As for the choice between tab characters and spaces, understand that there is no standard of how wide a single tab is. Depending upon your text editor, they could be displayed as the width of four spaces, six spaces, eight spaces. Uh, that's something that's up to your text editor. What I always prefer is to use a text editor that will automatically insert spaces instead of tabs when you hit the tab key. So in my text editor, when I hit the tab key, it inserts four spaces there rather than an actual tab character. The one variant of curly brace style which I find acceptable is one in which you place the curly brace immediately under the header, but only top level constructs like functions, methods, and classes, not for control flow like ifs and whiles. I think the idea behind this style is that some people like the top level constructs like functions and methods to stand out more in code. In another variant style, though, the opening curly brace is placed in that position for control flow structures as well, so for ifs and whiles, which I dislike because it means your code takes up a lot more vertical space. It's already bad enough that we have to use a whole line for just an end curly brace, so why would you want to make it worse and use a whole line for every opening curly brace as well? Although the curly brace languages, Java, JavaScript, C, etc., all allow you to omit the curly braces of a control flow statement in which there's only one statement in its body, I think you should always include the curly braces. Similarly, when a body has just one statement, some people will sometimes put that on the same line as the header, but this is also something I think you should never do.
My opinion is that uniformity is much more important than this minor savings on vertical space. Yes, it takes up more lines to express with the proper indentation, but if I just stick to the set style, I'll never have to think about it when I write my code or when I read my code. I won't waste any time sitting there and thinking, oh, maybe I should put this on the same line as the header because that'll make it take up less space. As much as possible, I believe you want to avoid those kinds of distractions. When it comes to formatting style, the most important thing after readability is whether it burdens the programmer with having to make choices. In the style I favor, the one formatting choice I leave myself is whether or not to take a really long function call, a long expression, and write it across multiple lines. Now, when this is done, one practice is to indent those successive lines such that they line up with the start of the first argument. I strongly recommend against trying to do this because it's just a waste of time getting your code to line up. Uh, in some editors you may have an assistance that will uh, automatically indent the lines this way, and if that's the case, well, that's okay. But I don't really think it's worth the bother, especially if you have to do it manually, then it just becomes a hassle. So you should just stick to using one or two levels of indentation. Some people prefer two because that makes them visually distinct from a control structure like a while loop. My personal preference, however, is to split a function across multiple lines such that it deliberately resembles a control flow structure. So I just use one level of indentation and I put the end parenthesis lined up with the start of the statement. Now, aside from those two rules, when it comes to placing the arguments, you have quite a bit of leeway. For instance, you can see here at the bottom we've actually placed two arguments on that last line, just because they're so short that it made sense to just place them there. In other cases, you may deem it clearest to put every single argument on its own line. In fact, for maximum clarity, you might bring down the first argument to its own line as well. In other cases, you might just decide to include multiple arguments on that top line. You don't just have, have one immediately after the opening parenthesis. So this is one area where there's quite a bit of leeway. Now, of course, the reason you would split a function call across multiple lines is that it got too long. So the question is, well, how long exactly is too long? Well, there's no hard and fast rule about this, but the general rule is that you don't want the entirety of your code to go past a certain column in your text. A commonly cited number is 80, 80 characters wide. So some people say that your code shouldn't extend past the 80th column in your text. That figure of 80, though, is probably outdated because that number comes from the old days of the terminals. 80 characters was a standard width for terminals. So if you went past 80 characters on most people's screens, it would wrap around to the next line, and most people didn't like that. Today, though, of course, we have screens which are much wider and have higher resolution. So 80 characters, I think, is excessively constrained. However, I believe most people feel that you don't want to go too much beyond that. Like maybe 120 characters is sort of like the upper limit of how wide you want your code to get. Personally, I don't really pay attention to the precise column width of the code I'm writing. Uh, what I do instead is I first of all avoid writing code with too many levels of indentation, uh, which mainly means within a function to only have control flow that goes, say, like three or four levels deep at most. So I would be careful, say, of putting oh, an if inside 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 an if. You only want to go so far with that, and if you find that your logic requires you to go deeper, what you do is you take those uh, inner levels of nesting, the inner control flow, and you split them off into some separate function, and that way you avoid having to nest deeply. This not only prevents your lines from getting too long, as we discussed later, it actually leads to writing better functions. Uh, you don't want to have control flow in your functions, which is overly complicated. So you split the logic off into a separate function. That's my first strategy for avoiding lines which are too long. Beyond that, I simply look at individual lines and just eyeball how wide they are. Uh, how wide they are in terms of from where they start, after the indentation, not counting the indentation. For me, it's just a matter of how complicated and verbose that one line looks, and if I don't like it, I split it up into multiple lines. In general, this usually keeps me under the 120 column mark. The one allowance I make, though, is sometimes when you write an end-of-line comment after a line, I don't really care how far off onto the right that stretches. If I have to horizontally scroll a few screen widths or two to read some of my end-of-line comments, that doesn't really bug me. And as I discussed later, sometimes with end-of-line comments, you're trying to comment an individual line, so it just always makes most sense to place it at the end of that line, even if that makes the line on that text very wide. I'm willing to live with that trade-off just to have the comment in the logical position. Now, while it generally is good practice to attempt to group the related statements within your functions by using blank lines to separate those groups, a common newbie mistake is to end up with functions where there's a blank line virtually every other line. 
it's quite easy actually to end up writing a function like this because you're trying to group the statements but it's not unusual for every line in the function to feel like it belongs to its own group, like it's not related to the line that follows. So you end up with a space between every single line. If you end up doing this, you should go through and just remove the blank lines, because it turns out that this particular function just there's no really natural way to split it up into groups. It's all just one disparate statement after the other. But that's perfectly okay. In some functions, the statements can be naturally divided into groups, and in others they can't. Some people take from this the lesson that you shouldn't try and include blank lines in your functions at all. I think that's a valid style, but it's probably overkill. I think it's still nice to attempt, at least, to split up the statements in a function with blank lines, just to give the code some breathing room. It's just nicer to read, usually, if there's a blank line, say, every four or five lines on average. Just don't go overboard and put a blank line every other line. That just looks silly. Last thing concerning formatting is how should you organize things within your files and within other constructs like classes. My opinion is that you should simply order things by grouping like constructs together. So, for example, within a file of Python code, you'll have some number of classes, maybe some number of functions, and maybe some number of statements, some actual code to execute within the module. Well, the functions should be grouped together, the classes grouped together, and those statements grouped together. Whether you put the classes or functions first generally doesn't really matter. I believe standard practice in Python is to put the functions first, though I'm not clear on that. Though the statements, obviously, you would put at the end, because the statements may use those functions and classes. And for that to work in Python, the functions and classes have to come first. Similarly, within a construct like a class, you should group the members by basic type. So say, a class in Java, you would put all the fields first and all the methods afterwards. Maybe you would refine things a bit further and put all the public fields before the private fields and all the public methods before the private methods, or vice versa. The important thing is to have a convention and just stick with it. Now, what you should not do is, amongst your functions or amongst your classes, attempt to order them in a way that's either alphabetical or related by purpose. So say, don't place two functions next to each other just because they have to do with uh, string handling or they're both math functions or because maybe one invokes the other, or they're mutually recursive, or anything like that. The problem with trying to group things like this is that while in some cases the grouping by purpose may be fairly clear, in other cases it's a very iffy judgment call. It's a very subjective sort of thing. And just like we just discussed with these statements within a function, it's sometimes hard to group them naturally. Sometimes each one seems to just be standalone. You very often have the same situation with functions, where there's just no obvious way of grouping them. And so the problem is, if there's no obvious way of grouping the functions, then first off, the way of grouping that seems most natural to you is not going to seem natural to someone else. They're going to maybe have something else in mind. And you may not even consistently agree with yourself. So you write the code one week, and you group them this way, and then you come back to the code a week later, and you have no idea why you group the functions that way, why things are where they are. So the basic problem is that it's a fool's game. Moreover, in the cases where there is a very clear grouping, the better solution there is to group things properly into maybe a separate class or into a separate file. Moving things into separate files or separate classes can be bothersome, but that work, unlike just merely moving some functions around within a file, that work will actually really gain you something in terms of organization. If you try and organize things by just rearranging them within a file, you're mostly just going to disorient yourself in your code. This is actually one of the most bothersome constant aspects in writing code, is that you very often want to quickly navigate between various functions, and if they're in the same file, that means scrolling up and down constantly and scanning until you see the function you're looking for, or the class you're looking for, or whatever. This scanning process typically heavily relies on your spatial memory of where things are in relation to other things. If you're moving things around, you're just screwing with your spatial memory. So, beyond grouping things by like construct, you're mostly wasting your time if you try and logically reorder things in your code. For the most part, you should just let things lie where you happen to write them the first time, unless you're actually reorganizing things in terms of classes or splitting things into separate files. That, in contrast, can actually be helpful, especially in the long term. Now, I'll emphasize again that in practice, simply navigating up and down your code in a single file gets really bothersome while you're trying to write code. We have basically two ways of mitigating this problem. The first is that some IDEs will include a sidebar that is a list of all the elements within your file of code, and you just click on that element, like say the name of the function, and the IDE will move your cursor and scroll you to that element, to that function or whatever. 
The other way of addressing the problem is simply trying to keep your files from getting too large. The more lines your file has, the more bothersome it becomes to navigate up and down. In my experience, I can start to get lost within a file once it grows past about 500 lines in length. So I try to ideally keep my files down to about 500 lines. In practice though, my files probably average uh, quite a bit higher than that, maybe 750 or something. It does generally depend upon the language you're working in. In Java, for example, there's no way you can split a class across multiple files, and so if you have a large class, you basically just have to live with having a large file. Though, when you write Java code, you almost always are using an IDE like Eclipse or NetBeans, so you can always navigate using the list of elements in the sidebar. You generally don't have that navigation, though, when you're working in a dynamic language like JavaScript or Python. IDEs for JavaScript and Python do exist, but they generally don't work as well as with static languages like Java, so they're not as commonly used. 